And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the in-development Void Empires 2750, the one and only Sam Wisa. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight? <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. Yourself? I'm, do I'm doing good. Um, I'm just counting the days until winter comes so I can start laughing at my neighbors again. Oh, sounds like there's a story behind that. <laughs> um, it's, it's not a, it's, I, I'm in Minnesota. I wear my Minnesotaness on my sleeve and I always get a laugh when it gets a little bit chilly and then everybody starts breaking out the down jackets and I'm, and I'm like, seriously, wait, wait a few months for that. Um, like at least wait until the snow hits before you start bundling up. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I've seen and um I've seen people who um get who oh, who overdo it um just when a little bit of snow hits and it's not and it's not even December yet. I would unfortunately probably be one of your neighbors. I'm uh, even though I'm in Toronto right now, I am uh, in Toronto by way of originally Egypt, so me and the snow do not get along, sir. <laughs> Wait, Egypt? Yeah, that's uh, that is where I was born and spent my first ten years. Yeah. Um, well, if you're in Toronto, I have uh, my sympathies for dealing with Leafs fans. <laughs> I'm not sure we could carry this conversation. I think I may have some laws that require me to uh, either challenge you to a duel to the death, or at, at the very minimum, despite the fact that I'm not a hockey fan, but I have to end the conversation or something like that <laughs> as a Toronto resident. <laughs> Um, no, it's just, we are equal opportunity roasters here in the monastery and, of course. um, the Maple Leafs are, what are, have been one of my repeat, have been one of my repeat targets because every, every year Leafs fans act like they're God's gift to hockey and every year they choke. Of course. That's, and, and every year it makes millions upon millions of dollars regardless, so... <laughs> It's like we're forever hopeful it's going to happen. Yeah, um, I might, I might have, I might be, I might be a little bit kinder if it weren't for the fact that they haven't done anything in fifty-three years. That's true. <laughs> no, no, you have all the all the right to continue the roasting. Also, I have to wonder if um, Harold, if the old, if the old man Harold Ballard made some sort of deal with the devil or something, especially since the stuff he got, the stuff he. The stuff he got into during his tenure with both with both the Leafs and the Hamilton Tiger Cats almost feels almost feels like a cartoon. Um. Yeah. But, no, it's possible. <laughs> yeah, but it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So, with that kind of thing in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick for you. Hmm. Um, interesting. It's, um, I think, uh, my first introduction to just kind of the realm of really of imagination and more of a fantasy before hitting sci-fi setting started probably at a very young age with uh, books that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, Asterix and Obelix books. They're much more common, I think, in uh, Europe. Actually, I, I think I've, re I think I've read a few of those. Yeah, so it, it was kind of at a very young age, my first delve into like, oh, cool, this is something that is displaced from our current reality enough in terms of fantasy. It's, you know, deals with uh, Caesar and um, that time period with magic potions and a druid and warriors and stuff. So that was at an early age, which kind of led me slowly into the, I think they were called fighting fantasy books it's mm -hmm. kind of like the choose your own adventure but with a 2d6 element mm -hmm. i'm familiar with fighting fantasy yeah <laughs> so that entered and then enter high school with introduction to things such as of course dungeons and dragons and that's and i think i was i was starting to 
take a look at what are these strange dice. <laughs> That's basically when I had actually moved to Canada. So before then, it was, oh, there's these books that you use 2D6s, and you know, it's kind of like a solo adventure you would you would play on your own. And then, oh, there's now a group activity with different colored, cool-looking dice. So anyways, one thing led to the other, and over several years, um, it was almost all fantasy, uh, as in like historical fantasy, medieval fantasy, uh, you know, Tolkien-esque, uh, and so on. It then kind of meandered with university. I guess maybe it was the time. It was the mid to mid ninety mid nineties, beginning of the late nineties, where you know, White Wolf was a really big thing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so really got into that, uh, especially Mage, Wraith, uh, and so on. And it was only at around, I would say, a decade ago, so around 2010 or so, that I really started exploring um, sci-fi. And I think that just came out of the slow realization that I think with sci-fi, especially potentially more open-ended, less less near future, more far future sci-fi, mm -hmm. you had the potential to play out a lot of the fantasy settings in sci-fi as well. Um, so that's when I kind of started looking at different sci-fi games. And of course, you know, I, I'm sure um, a lot of us grew up with Star Wars in the background as well. So it was, it was kind of cool to be able to say, oh, uh, there's RPGs that are Star Wars-esque or Babylon-esque or Star Trek-esque and so on. So with Star Wars, or sorry, with um, with the kind of trying out sci-fi games, um, naturally, at some point in time, you're going to hit Traveler. Uh, mm -hmm. But for me, before Traveler, it was mostly Battletech. Uh, then it was, okay, well, maybe I'm playing D&D &D every once in a while, and Battletech's a board game. Maybe there's a way to have this RPG experience. And then, lo and behold, there was a Battletech RPG felt a bit cobbled on that's okay then you end up in traveler and that's when i really started falling in love with it throughout 90 percent of my time by the way and then all those couple of those few decades i've always been the one mostly uh 90 running games so mm -hmm. it took off with my close group of friends that we were playing traveler i got really involved in the traveler community um started having a lot of conversations with matt sprange as well as the um other authors uh, which I hope I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce their names. I'm probably already mispronouncing uh, uh, Matthew's name. But um, yeah, and then uh, one thing led to the other, and got really passionate. He asked me if I would like to work on uh, Mongoose Traveler Second Edition. I did that. I really enjoyed it. So it really kind of launched me into thinking about running my own game or creating my own game. Mostly because when you work on somebody else's game, and this was probably the most um, invested i was in someone else's game because um it, it was being responsible for a significant part of it mm -hmm. uh you still have boundaries especially with a with something like traveler so you know you work within those boundaries but it's not like full creative freedom to do whatever you want some things that are defining of traveler you're not going to change of course and that was it and that's that's the story basically of how i came to the realization you know what this is great but more creative freedom, I think, is only going to come with writing my own game or doing my own game. Mm -hmm. And that that brings me to um, to void to void empires. Now, when when you had when you had started when you had started out that project, was it with the goal of doing traveler and your doing traveler or, or um? Mac Warrior in your own style, or how how did it come about? Um, yeah, I think you you hit the, the nail on the head. Absolutely, it's basically um, with my my core group of friends, which is a sizable group. It's uh, six or seven of us most of the time. Um, we we looked and we were, we thought, okay, there are some really good things we like about Traveler. There are some things from Mac Warrior that are missing there are some things from generic sci-fi that are missing in traveler and so you start looking first the first thing you do is you know as uh, people with necessary well whether it's families and careers outside of the gaming industry you're not going to jump into hey let's just make our own game so you start looking at okay are there other substitutes or things that we can play instead I looked at a lot didn't find something that captured everything so then we started saying all right well maybe we make small tweaks 
the traveler. Okay, we need more than small tweaks. And so that's exactly how it was born. It was, how can we marry the aspects that we like from traveler and things that we would really like in traveler, but we don't find, um, and, and put it together in basically a kind of neat package. And it kind of felt to be the, you know, most of my friends looked at me like, well, You've been GMing slash DMing for the last two decades, 90% of our games. And uh, you like systems and you like to have, you know, systems that are immersive so that when you want to think of an idea in your head, you don't start to play it and stat it in the character. And then it doesn't play anything like your character fantasy. So go ahead, make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the, with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, um, you mentioned you mentioned go, going into whether it be traveler, whether it be science fic, whether it be generic science fiction, and and so on, and th things that you felt were missing. Could you give me a few examples on what some of those major things were, and that um you're that you're trying to implement within Void Empires? Absolutely. So um, there's a a few key um things. Some of them are more systems based some of them are more um like trope or flavor based so an example traveler very much shies away from shields like the idea of some sort of shields whether it's a star trek bubble of a shield or whether it's a slightly more i don't want to say hard sci-fi but i may as well uh some sort of field that is a reinforcement of a solid sort of piece of armor or something mm -hmm. so um that's that's one piece of it another one is the idea that the traveler ships when they're jumping they're like anywhere between you know 10 to 20 to 40 percent if not more fuel like some of the technologies around it were a little i guess they didn't sit well with our groups in terms of really that's how it works which is fine. They're not, mm -hmm. as you said, and I think a couple of your videos were, it's, it's highly subjective. Yeah. Um, but another thing too, there's some traveler technologies and I, and I don't want to get into too many details, but travelers started off in the, I believe late seventies. Yes. There are some things that you feel haven't left from there, right? There's not a lot of, um, uh, direct neural interface sort of approach that you're seeing in a lot of the more modern games it is uh, it more is of a fun. wireless thing yeah i don't i don't mean to cut off but it is kind of funny you mentioned that kind of thing because i've seen i've um for for the last 20 or so years i've been railing on traditions for its own sake and when i did the cyberpunk panel um a few weeks back we had talked we had talked a bit about how a lot of aspects within the cyberpunk genre are still far too rooted in the te in the techno the technological assumptions yeah. of the 1980s. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and so that's that's a key piece it was like uh, you want internal consistency but you don't want to feel like you still got vacuum tubes mm -hmm. and you know um <laughs> plug you have to plug into something and so on. So it's it's interesting. That's, you know, a lot of people, of course, that's a lot of the draw that uh, brings people sometimes to traveler. And especially, I mean, if you want to take another example, Star Wars, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the, some of the other things also were systemic in terms of, or sorry, system rather, not systemic, yeah. but uh, rooted in the system such as there's no necessarily perk advantage slash disadvantage feet, call it what you want system, that sort of thing. Um, character customization seems a little a little lacking like skill based is good i think skill based is really good for especially for sci-fi mm -hmm. but some sort of reward that makes you better and go above and beyond almost into a superhero capacity as you become one of the top five pilots or the top five entertainers or the top five merchants in like a quadrant somewhere in the galaxy so that sort of ability to customize your character um and or vehicle and or spacecraft mm -hmm. the character part was missing of course the spacecraft part was missing as well sorry not missing was um was done in such a way that it was you know you could customize a lot but it also lent itself to um 
I want to say, uh, a very, very narrow, optimal approach to building and customizing. And that's sometimes what games I feel fall into when, um, when you have a highly customizable game, you end up with a very narrow, let's call it meta, where it's mm -hmm. everything else seems like a trap. And that that's been a that's another that's another thing that we, that we with Traveler that hit me where. I want meaningful choices. We really wanted meaningful choices, whether you want to use an energy weapon or a slug weapon, or you want to, um, you want to be someone who's charismatic, who can actually influence, um, let's say, uh, a threatening scenario or a point of uh, where you find yourself vulnerable strictly with your social stats, or you want to charge in with a large hammer because you feel like you want to be that, do be doing that, you know, 2000 years in the future. But I want to, I, you know, you're not going to make everything equally perfect, but you're, you could put in the effort to make character choices more viable, regardless of the way you go, rather than very quickly them seeming like a trap. And why don't I just use X? Oh, this is useless. This character choice. I should have just did Y like my other buddy here sitting to the left of me sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that kind of thing, that kind of thing is in is interesting um the argument that i often i often see when people try and argue against having some sort of um perk-based approach is is that is that you're is that you're gamifying the system which i always find kind of silly because it's a game <laughs> yeah at the yeah. end of, at the end of the day this is um you can get as simulation-y as humanly possible and believe me i'd know i've covered two games that are tr that were trying to go for that um <laughs> but at the end of the day it's still a game um so and as far as far as as far as people trying to gamify it or tr or try to take advantage um that's going to happen regardless no even in even in the simplest kind of games people will inevitably find some sort of meta or find some sort of loophole mm -hmm. to take advantage of. The ultimate example of that in um, video game examples would be speedrunners. Yep. Absolutely. And I think um, I think uh, you bring up a very good point here, uh, Mildred, which is, um, you know, gamifying or, you know, used to be called min-maxing or now it's optimization or whatever the case is. Munchkin. And, sorry? Munchkinning. <laughs> Munch could, oh yes how could i forget that and um you know it's interesting because i remember i, I don't want to segue too much but it, it was always such a hot topic when you're playing white wolf games but I, so i think just to, to have an, an abstract overview of that i don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be really good at what you do mm -hmm. i think and in my in my large my fairly large gaming group um with the exception of probably one person <laughs> who's probably gonna listen to this interview after um all of us would think of the character concept when we're making characters and then try to make that character concept good at what their concept or their calling is. And I think, I think that's great. Yeah. Whether you're, again, entertainer, merchant, free merchant, trader, uh, sniper, assassin, Jedi, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that's, you want to make that good at what you want to do. I mean, there's also comical aspects. You can make a character who's bad and thinks they're great, but for the most part, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to optimize the concept you want to play. I yeah. think where I find issues, especially as a mostly a GM or a DM, is when you look for what is the most optimal mechanical choice and you just try and play that. But I have no problem with you know a bunch of guys or um, uh, or girls at my table or anyone else for that matter who wants to play a certain um, character and then puts in the effort to be like, how do I do my, what's my, my theme, my, my concept, how do I do it? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think the game should definitely support different, whole different, basically callings that could impact the game and have meaningful, um, uh, basically meaningful impacts on the scenes that you're running, despite their calling or how they've chosen to play that character, as long as they put the effort into making that character, good or better basically mm -hmm. now when it comes when it comes to when it, com when it comes to when it comes to that whole um munchkin munchkinning personally 
since you mentioned the whole idea of, pl of playing to an archetype, I will admit that when wh whenever I start up a game with my players, I'll have them come up with the um, general idea, general concept of their character first, and then we build around that. Mm -hmm. Where I've often seen problems is when the is when that particular concept um, is made is made more difficult by the mechanics. Have you had have you ever had something similar to that? Yeah, I think absolutely in in almost every game and I would be silly to think that I've somehow eliminated in my game, but it's something I'm very cognizant of. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of my biggest I don't it's pet peeves and my biggest and maybe the only reason or that makes me um, modify uh, games. Uh, that I play from, like, make small house rules. I'll give you an example, Mildred, of something like that. Mm -hmm. Let's say I want to play a fighter pilot in a game that's Star Trekish, Star Warish, and so on. And then I make that character, and, and there's a space combat scene. And then I realize the system, which, it, like, 99% of systems uses my skills to affect, basically, the dice roll of how well I can try to hit a target. However, and this is a this is this is one I see in a lot of sci-fi games, surprisingly. My skill to avoid taking damage, or I have no skill that actually relevantly impacts my ability to avoid damage. So I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, A, why would anyone be a fighter pilot? B, <laughs> how am I any better than Joe Schmo fighter pilot that started yesterday? C, what am I doing in this death trap sort of thing? So <laughs> I think I used like fighter pilot as a good example because it's one of those ones where when I see it's like a character concept. I want to be this, I'm a leaf in the wind sort of character <laughs> and I can fly through things. Um, wait, you mean my skill, my agility skill or my wit skill doesn't affect my ability to get hit in space. Yeah. Okay. So same thing. Like, I mean, you could transpose that example with like an assassin or someone in melee or someone who is great from, um, I like a, uh, from uh, from social skills perspective, where mm -hmm. somehow they're, they they have an idea, they think about it, and then they cut, they sit down, they try and roll it, and they're like, oh, I can't I can't influence this this way, or I can't do it, or this skill doesn't help me in the way I thought it does. So that I feel that actually makes me feel bad for the player because they have this crazy cool idea in their head, and the system is like, no, sorry, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, um, and I. And obviously, you probably have the same approach—the same approach that I, that I I do when the system says you can't do that. Fuck you. You you say, oh, fuck me. No, fuck you. <laughs> and, and and just bend and just bend the rules to make it work. Yeah, yeah. And that was that was probably that was my number one inspiration to uh, take part in Mongoose Second Edition was to see those elements. Um, and, and try to rectify them. Uh, another example for Mongoose was very simply where the fact that, you know, like many games, sci-fi games, it has power armor. And then I realized in a couple of, you know, with minimal effort, your power armor was routinely, um, your, your multi-million dollar power armor that basically is something we would come up with on Earth, let's say in Mongoose terms at the year 27, 2800, was routinely penetrated by a, a, a 1950s AK. <laughs> so so much for your class fantasy or your role or archetype fantasy that you want to be this space marine from something like starcraft and mm -hmm. you drop through orbit and you land and some guy with torn shorts <laughs> a couple of flip-flops or something like that pops off a couple of shots and there go your character and the four million dollar piece of power armor that you're wearing <laughs> yeah yeah and when it comes now, well, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to that, obviously, when dealing with something like space opera, there's a lot of ways you can take it, which is which to me, I think I think it's part of the appeal of space opera. That's why, um, like since we mentioned Star Wars, an example, I um, I will I will be flat out honest and and say I have um. Unless it's a certain campaign, I have kept the idea of Jedi on the tightest of leashes, mm -hmm. because because I completely agree with Ralph Coster. <laughs> um, 
if you don't know the story in that, Ralph Costa was the designer for the Star Wars Galaxies MMO. And until so, until Sony uh, yanked his chain on that, yes. he in, he insisted on not having Jedi playable. And his reasoning was that they would be a clear alpha class. Was he the one behind attempting to make it like it's a, either a temporary class and then you eventually get hunted and so on? Was he the same person behind that origi- that scrapped approach and never made it, I believe, as well? Um, that w- I, th- I can't confirm that, but I think that was one of the things he had suggested. The whole thing of, well, if I'm going to do it, fine. If I'm going to do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not make it easy. <laughs> Which is which is why yeah. the whole holocron thing and be and being randomly force sensitive was used instead. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. I, I get you. I mean. Um, yeah. There's. <laughs> you. You bring back some memories of that game too. I didn't play it for too long. Yeah. Um. I. I ended up. I ended up leaving right. Right after the. Uh, right after the. Right after the first time they overhauled it. Um. With with um the combat two point setup, um mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't stick around for new game exp- for N- for the NGE era or new game experience. Um, but when it come now when it comes to when it come well when it comes to um the technology that you're shooting for with um Void Empires how. How how um hard or soft SF are you shooting for? Um, so it's interesting, Mildred. I'm sure we can have a whole conversation on this. My definition of hard SF falls into the camp of internally consistent rather than um realistic based on today's technology. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So with that, I am trying for very hard SF in terms of whatever hand wave technology um, I put in, I'm trying to make sure that there isn't going to be a scenario where someone goes, wait, if we have this technology, how is this a problem? Or how does this issue exist? Or how are, why are, you know, um, why are uh, interstellar empire so small or so on? So that's, that's the hard SF Mm -hmm. I'm going for where, um, I'll give you an example. Um, Battletech, Battletech thruster engines, where they're saying they would uh, Battletech engines, uh, as they exist in Battletech universe, should be strong enough to blow away significant parts of the planet that they're taking off of. <laughs> I think was uh, one of the examples used. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. So, for example, I have shields. They're abstractly called shields. Um, however, they're not something that you can put on a belt. Um, they are large they can only be used to reinforce um solid treated craft armor or maybe power armor um this is because i wanted to avoid the idea of you know people walking around with a small pellet like thing on their belts where it caught there's a nice little form-fitting body bubble around it so i that's the level of kind of hard sf i'm Mm -hmm. going for um another piece is anti-grav yeah. Uh, this is a good example. So anti-gravity, or rather the ability, I went to significant uh, level of, I don't want to say significant level of, I went to some effort to describe where you have either inertialist drives, why they don't work next to planets, um, how you have um, artificial gravity through the use of superconductors. I even consulted with a buddy of mine who works at uh, the Jet Propulsion Labs because <laughs> I was like, does this sound crazy? Does it not sound crazy? Tell me if I have this, what magical other things can suddenly start happening because I don't want someone to say, if you have anti-grav, why don't you have anti-grav on planets? And then we're talking about you know impact from other gravity sources within 100 radiuses of or 100 radii of that source and so on. So I've went to some effort to try to make things internally Mm -hmm. consistent in such a way that it would support multiple, I guess, tropes. So yes, you have inertialist drives in space, which make the concept of actually trying to dodge something feasible because otherwise with momentum, if you had momentum and you had, uh, you know, any sort of better than average computer, you're going to be able to hit something at 10,000 kilometers. It's not going to really dodge you. So 
here's how we're kind of talking about dodge is the fact that you have no momentum, the fact that you have no inertia is an ability that allows you to quickly change direction. So it's more Star, Star Trek-ish where you're plotting attack pattern, defensive pattern, and then let's keep it at that level abstract. You don't have yeah. to think about how someone is actually dodging exactly that laser beam at 10,000 kilometers out. We just know that mathematically, if you can change direction instantly, it can be done because you've got like a quarter second or whatever the case is. So, <laughs> and then we didn't want anti-grav taking over everything. So that's the reasoning behind, here is why that inertialist, let's say displacement drive style technology and artificial gravity fails to function as you get closer to any gravity any body with a significant gravitational field so as you get closer to planets now we have more of a reason to have more advanced hyper advanced but traditional forces you're still going to have to drop to the atmosphere you, you may have war walkers or mech, or mechs or tanks it's not just you know as you get to a certain technology level everyone's using grav belts and grav tanks right so we wanted to create more meaningful choices in that. And that was really kind of arrived at with what do we like in other games and how do we make it internally consistent in a hard sci-fi manner in our game? And then of course I say that and then I throw in psionics, but yeah. <laughs> um, well, well, if, well, if Star, if Star Trek is going to, is going to boast about, how, is going to boast about how, how, how hard SF it is and then it pulls in psionics, I say, why not? Oh God, yeah. I don't think any. Um, I mean, again, I people can um, well, Neil deGrasse Tyson whatever way they want to argue it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to don't want to argue it, but I don't think any of my colleagues consider sci uh, Star Trek or Star Wars hard sci-fi at all. With you know, when you start getting in in certain, I guess, movies and so on, the ability to a you have faster light communication, and then you have transporting off of things moving faster than light ending up halfway across the galley. It's just like, okay, well, now we're in the realm of everything is possible. Why don't we even have ships anymore? Why don't we try to use this technology to do X? Hey, these gates, why don't we think about teleport, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it quickly starts to, that's what I'm hopefully trying to avoid with uh, Void 2750. Yeah. Now, what that brings me to the question of FTL, faster than light travel. Um, do you even have it, or how, or how is it go? How is it going to work? How's it going to work? So I actually, I definitely have FTL. I do not have FTL comms. So it's very much an age of sail style thing. Um, it is a jump drive. Uh, the jump drive technology is basically much like a well aimed catapult or a slingshot. You make the calculation, you plot it in. You make your jump, which takes you, depending on the power of your jump drive, anywhere up to 15 parsecs um, over a five-day period, plus or minus several hours. So um, it's not accurate. It's not like super accurate in terms of time. It does take you a very, very good distance. It allows for that learning opportunity downtime in that five-day period you know, people use to basically either improve skills, have any sort of that, um, I don't know if there's an official term for it, but that sort of, uh, I don't know what the, the term for it is. It's like when the, the more chilled, relaxed role play of over a five day basically travel, like maybe you can put up, we've definitely used it for some plot points before, whether it's someone who's a stowaway, whether there's some issues, but mostly it's the, okay, I'm going to relax. I want to maybe craft this. I want to learn that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then once you get to your destination, so we didn't want to use fuel. Um, that was, that was kind of how Traveler did it. It used a significant part of your ship was basically a fuel tank. And then you had to spend days sifting fuel from like a lake or a gas chine. Um, what I opted for was, uh, this is one of those jet propulsion technology mm -hmm. things, <laughs> uh, buddy of mine. And, um, we, we basically assumed that you have to flush exotic particles that build up in your jump drive once you're done your jump, which could take a lot of days if you're going to do it as like a pirate hiding out somewhere. But generally, that supports the the kind of hard sci-fi reasoning for space stations. Space stations or space ports uh, would have the right, obviously large, cumbersome facilities that would help you flush that in possibly hours or minutes, depending on the size of your ship. So that propagates the 
This is why spaceports and civilization is important. This is why travel takes some time, but it also limits the size of interstellar empires because if you're taking five days to travel, you know, like human empires, there's only a certain amount of distance you can go before you lose the actual efficient governance of those satellite zones. So, yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, I do want to I do want to dip into a bit of um, a bit of the a bit of the crunch. Now, sure. First off, I'll I'll start with the I'll start with the basics. Um, now this might this might seem a bit obvious in hindsight, but was the reason you went with two d six just a case of um, habit? Since you had met, given the um, game book st type stuff, you had mentioned starting out with. Um, no, actually, it was um, it was very. Um, I didn't want the one to twenty variants. To be perfectly honest, I wanted a bit more of a bell curve, and I wanted skills to matter more without having like your your skills and attributes and the effort and the meaningful choices you put in your character mm -hmm. to start overshadowing pure randomness um, as time went on and as you built that super character, whether you're thinking some someone from the Expanse, Firefly, so on and so forth, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, and so on. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a Jedi or whether it's the ultimate uh, uh, a politician, sniper, tradesman, whatever. I wanted, as your attributes and your skills went up and maybe you got a couple of uh, perks, uh, then you were really rolling the dice to see how well you do not have a possible chance to, you know, one in 20 or even one in 36 to be basically fall down flat on your face. <laughs> and I'm get I'm guessing that's also the reason why you opted for margins instead of allowing for some sort of um, success, critical, or failure botch um, formula? Yeah, I think that's something that sticks with me even from my earliest days of playing RPGs online or MMOs. I was a... Criticals are fun, don't get me wrong. Um, but I want them to be an extra bit of fun, especially available to you also when you specialize in something rather than um, the ability to critically succeed at something you've barely ever done in your life. <laughs> um, like, let's say you have horrible social skills and you are no good at lying and you're carrying contraband. I didn't want you to suddenly get a good role and instantly, somehow, you start convincing the customs officer that it's actually his buddy, the other customs officer, that is on some inside job and he starts arresting him because it's like a massive, massive role. So that's why I wanted to say, um, I wanted to kind of avoid the critical success uh, in that regard. The only way I have criticals is from a critical damage perspective. It's fairly rare, but it becomes more common as you start taking the right perks and specializing in the area with a particular weapon group or weapon type mm -hmm. to say, hey, I want to be I want to be that guy sort right. of thing. And when it and um what now when it comes to when it comes to um when it comes to combat were you aim did you want to aim for a fairly lethal approach or or a little bit less so um so i kind of wanted both and i know it's a it's a cheap answer but i'll try and explain it as best as i can um i enjoyed i and i do enjoy a lethal approach and i think a lot of players especially when they put effort in their characters they want to be able to mow down through things they're encountering fairly easily to feel like they've made that sort of investment maybe of course there's a there you also want the challenge when it comes into some sort of um, specific named enemy let's say or boss or something like that so if you're not well armored against a weapon of a particular tech level it is a it is a pretty lethal approach um, if you put in the effort mm -hmm. to get um, protected against the weapons of that 
let's call it, I think I called it, um, not I think, but I know I called it tech base. So let's say you're at that highest tech base and uh, you know you're going to be fighting these top of the line guys and you take the time and effort and the investment to put in the highest tech base worth of defenses uh, in your suits, in your um, weaponry, in your med kits and all that stuff, then it's pretty cinematic. Mm -hmm. um, and again, even if it's cinematic, if you're the maintenance slash space engineer that's sitting on the ship and yeah you've got a couple of nice you've got your nice power armor suit you've got a nice plasma shotgun you're still not going to take as much as that uh you know that marine who looks like he's got a second set of muscles <laughs> a shitload of cyber and bio and has dumped millions upon millions of his credits into becoming basically a a walking wall that has power armor on top of it so um just like that fighter pilot example, you may be the best fighter pilot. You get in a little scuffle at some port that's got a few, let's say, uh, shady characters in it. You don't want to be catching. You want to catch maybe one rifle shot if you're in that really good armor. You don't want to be catching two or three rifle shots. So I, I don't want someone to suddenly lose their character from a stray shot, assuming they've put in some effort to try and um, guard against that. Yeah. And I'm, get, I'm guessing in the same vein... Um trying to not get hit is going to be more important than tanking. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, so um, I'm a bit of a math geek in terms of when I start, and I did this for Traveler um, second edition. I, I did a whole bunch of Excel sheets where I sat there looking at average damage, max damage, max damage on a relatively good hit where you add the margin, max damage on a really big hit, max damage with no margin versus protection available at that same technology level and th there are a couple of ways yes you can build in my game specifically at least a traveler probably a little less so but still relevant you can fully build um in terms of mitigating your damage you can go fully dodge rolly sort of ninja assassin style you can even go the deflecting jedi style and either go dodge rolly or the force field throwing up jedi mm -hmm. or you can go the space marine massive implants um with power armor with a power armor reinforced like physical shield on top of it and just soak more so by soak you will weather more damage you may not ignore significantly more damage so you're you're not going to tank forever you'll just tank longer significantly longer than the person trying not to get hit yeah mm and with the, with this kind um with this kind of thing in mind a lot of, a lot of times whenever i've talked about um games that are very games that are very skill centric um the ter the term that i the term that always comes to my mind where i have to discuss is how they handle choice paralysis because obviously when you've got a lot of options there's the you end up you end up with two issues. One, you end up with the skill gap, where you have people who are have no clue what they're how they're going to go about their um particular approach, and you have the people who already know it and are and are optimizing with um their eyes closed. Um, I realize that Void Empires is in is an in development pro project, so everything that I'm, everything that might be said about this is in flux, but when it comes to choice paralysis, what what do you see are some of the ways that you plan on mitigating that potential issue? Um, okay, and please correct me if I'm not answering the question properly. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that tries to come down to reducing what I would call traps or basically non-meaningful choices. So I try to keep it as straightforward as possible. For example, there's only five attributes. Um, the skills are very straightforward in what they do. There is inherent benefits to just getting skills at a higher level. So once your skill hits uh, level two or hits level four, or you make it legendary and it hits level five, there's inherent benefits to using that skill. I grant you bonuses for rolling that skill, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. you know at level five, you can double your bonus once a day for that uber legendary action. At whether at level four, you get one reroll of that skill. So I'm trying to basically pack in the benefits for people who thematically make the choice of this is what I want to do. 
and so that they don't feel like oh crap that was a bad buy i shouldn't have done that that doesn't do anything now there's always going to be i think and i know one of uh one of my one of my uh, players can run into this a few times which is they try to be the jack of all trades and i don't know they're not they're like the seven of clubs of all trades so you can always <laughs> screw yourself that way right you can always like if if you're going to go out of your way to get average stats and everything and one to two skill points and everything sure but i mean maybe that's more fixed by a conversation ahead of time mm -hmm. <laughs> with your colleagues and your gm to just say you know try and at least get yourself out you don't have to master something but at least some sort of niche rather than i can raise my hand to make every skill roll that's asked for and i'm just not doing it well <laughs> Because I don't you, think. Would you say that's? Would you say that some of that can be mitigated by a GM talking to their player about what sort of campaign that they're running? Oh, absolutely. I think I even um, I even put that in uh, part of my forward here in the game, or part of my initial parts, uh, initial uh, paragraphs where we talk. I kind of introduce what the technology is in the game, how things like I talk about cyber versus bio. Think about your character mm -hmm. concept, um, implants versus psionics, because they're semi mutually um basically they, they degrade the performance of one another but i also talk about discuss the role you want to play because it may be cool to want to play a, that fighter pilot but if you're never going to be in a small craft <laughs> and you're mostly going to be playing a cyberpunkish style maybe there's the, the main world you're on and one moon you, you know there, there's no point having that expertise or that unless you you want that as your character concept and you're fully cognizant of that but being that super fighter pilot who's never going to be in a fighter so the same method by the same sorry uh, uh reasoning um yeah definitely that early conversation about don't be that seven of clubs of all trades because yeah that's not gonna that's not gonna go over well and, and i think to me i think it's probably second nature just because we always discuss that as you said that you do with your um players as well mildred always like okay guys what what's the concept we're doing and is this concept relevant for this campaign um and should i keep it or should i play it even if it's not relevant because it could be comical and entertaining anyways yeah um like i think i think in one case i i remember telling i remember telling my players that we were get we were going to be running a um a a um campaign that i will free i will freely admit i cited um Things like oh, things like ODST from the Halo series as my inspiration for that, and I basically said mm -hmm. we're running a military centric campaign, so keep that kind of thing in mind. And if you're gonna be, um, if you're gonna be vent, if you're gonna be veering away from that, um, I expect you to um, get to give me a good enough reason. Yeah, exactly, because um, right, you don't want headaches for you and them after. <laughs> you don't want any whether it's resentment or just negative kind of emotion where it's just like, oh, well, I'm not really contributing. This is not going well. So if they know that ahead of time, great. <laughs> um, and the, th the something that I find, something that I find kind of interesting is when it comes to some of the tech that you've got within it, despite what you mentioned before about some tech levels, and I'm not making this as a criticism. I want to make it clear. Um, it's just a lot of times something like cybernetics is usually affiliated with cyberpunk games and not as often with space opera, even though it has happened. Um, yeah. I'm curious as to your reasoning for intro for introducing things like things like um, cybernetics or, or their biological equivalents within um, void empires. Sure. Um, so one of the games we love as well from a sci-fi perspective, of course, is Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. um, and this comes back to meaningful choices, where cybernetics was a bit of an afterthought into Traveler. It, it, they did some good effort in it, absolutely, but it was a, it was a bit of an afterthought. Um, so it really came into is okay, how I can add more customization options to uh, basically this toolkit for space opera because i mean you're jumping across planets you're setting up your your you're running trade or contraband in between interstellar empires there's aliens you would think with technology marches on why wouldn't you if that and it's an entertaining enough trope <laughs> that 
this cybernetics piece should be in there. Um, it's because maybe, you know, being a fighter pilot is great, but now I'm going to add this eye enhancements and this reflex augmentation and this quickness of thought kind of augmentation. And that's what added cyber uh, cybernetics and mm -hmm. BioWare. We took a slightly modified approach for BioWare, again, all in the interest of meaningful choices where BioWare is less intrusive than cybernetics. That's not original. What is what we tried to make original is some things you could not, um, and I think it's even explicit in there, you may not be able to get some of the extreme ability of cybernetics with Bioware. Right? I mean, you can think about cloned um, idyllic or ide cloned ideal, let's say, upper bodies or mm -hmm. uh, organs and so on to give you that perfect sort of human performance, you know, but if I can make some sort of advanced alloy, actually upper body, <laughs> that would probably still be better at the end of the day. So it's not just a, this is, you know, bio is just cyberware with a plus one, like it's better. No, it's all about meaningful choices. Same with psionics, which is why we had this interesting play that I Shadowrun does to some degree, but it does it in a very absolute punishing manner, which is the more cyber you have, the less room you can have for psionics and vice versa, mm -hmm. but it doesn't hit your absolute value. It doesn't make it so that all your psionics suck because you have a bit of cyber. It actually affects your breadth of psionic knowledge. So yeah. therefore you can be a really cool space engineer cyber shaman where you've got implants, you're a space engineer on some sort of, you know, capital ship or even a trader, and you've got, uh, Psy, uh, Psy Machina, as I call it, which is, or Psy Machina, which is basically, you, you don't you don't have all the disciplines of being a Jedi, but you've got the two that you need to really work really well with machines. Mm -hmm. So, and they won't, because you've got cyber, it's not like your Psy Machina or your Psy Machina is gonna suffer. It's, it's gonna complement. You just don't expect to be throwing lightning bolts or force sabers or being a psychic vampire as well. You're, yeah. You know, you've limited yourself to one or two sonic lines in addition to your cyber yeah um i'm guessing i'm guessing by the way you wrote about that you're not would it be would it be fair of me to say that you're not the biggest fan of shadow runs essence system yeah i think um so it's funny in shadow run the few times i i did play it rather than run it i always played uh oh god now i'm gonna say is it is it major sorcerer i think it's combat mage almost always combat mage. And I was defined jokingly by my um, always wanting to big money shot kind of thing. So <laughs> I would wait around, I'd be playing with my crew and mm -hmm. I, I love the essence system in so much as as soon as I'd find any sort of lieutenant or boss, I would overcast the biggest bolt I could. And then guys, I'm unconscious, take care of me. <laughs> but um, I didn't like it in the fact that there wasn't a lot of meaningful choices, right? When you played combat mage, it's like, you did not get implants. You like, you make sure you have the highest essence you possibly could because it's going to be key to all your force and all your power and so on. So I, I didn't, I wanted more. And that's what I did with my game, which is what if I wanted to be a combat mage, but I was going to say, I didn't want any illusion mm -hmm. or any body magic, for example. And then I could take cyber. Like that's how I think it maybe should have played off, which is, I limit my accessibility to certain schools for the cost of cyber rather than make all my magic suck crap and therefore hobble myself as a combat mage just by getting any cyber. So yeah, I guess in, in that regard, that's why I wasn't a, too much of a fan. Yeah. And I, I can definitely, I can definitely understand that. Um, I mean, for, for the longest time I ended up get it. It's one, it's one of those things where, Shadowrun likes to likes to make the claim that it's not a um, like it's a that's a free form class based system or that a class less system. Let me clarify, um, but in practice, it really isn't. Yeah, I would, I would agree, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't, and I think you know to 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 be perfectly honest, I think especially as you get bigger groups, you have to watch out about classless systems where there could be overlap if you don't have a lot of, let's say, use for the different roles. Yeah. Like, you know, um, but you're absolutely right. I don't, 
I think, you know, with what I find with a lot of systems that claim they're classless is yes, okay, they could be classless on paper, but from an effectiveness perspective at wanting to have a useful character concept that excels at what it does, you're going to be very quickly, you may not, you may not have an explicit class, but you're going to want to double down on what you're good at. Yeah. And even, even with, um, even with that, the reason why I say it's a, it's a, um, classless system and name only is when, in my experience, when people are building their particular party, um, with Shadowrun, for all intents and purposes, they are still, they are still using the art, they're still using the, um, archetypes that are, that are in the book, even if they don't yeah. outright say it. Um, yep. like if, if somebody, if somebody, if somebody is a, um, if somebody is going to be doing a whole, a whole lot of combat, a whole lot of combat, they're either get, you can easily see them as being, um, a weapon specialist or a street samurai, depending on their loadouts. Um, and you can, and you can tend to look at how they've got it set up and it's clear that it's meant to, it's meant to have a specific role. Yeah. And exactly as you're saying, depending on what they choose, they're generally taking half of the game and possibly like whether it's essence or implants or whatever you're going for. And you're basically saying, no, never going to look at that. I, I'm never going to mix and match with that. Yeah. And at the starting point, there's no problem with that. The, I think the problem really happens when it comes to after the fact, like the long, the long range game when it comes to um, characters, yeah. because ultimately when you have, ultimately when you stick too much to that role, to that role, well, who's who's to say that who's to say that somebody doesn't pick up a few tricks as they wor as they um, work with somebody who has powers or or learn some. We all learn we all learn some sort of talents that we did that we didn't have in the past with time. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, that's, that's just one of the things I was trying to go for is unless you go out of your way to make someone who is either fully 100% psionic, like I'm, you know, that hermit, you know, Gandalf the Grey style or Yoda, or or you go the opposite way and you're gonna make this fully cyber space marine, you know, maybe 10% of your body is actually still tissue. Unless you wanna go for that character concept, you'll find that whatever concept you're in between, your, the systems will back you up in doing that mixing and matching Mm -hmm. to try to get better and add flavor to what you do without penalizing you um, in that way. So whether it's that fighter pilot, whether it's that, you know, assassin, whether it's that um, interstellar trader, you're going to want to mix and match because I, I, I just, I feel it's more entertaining, right? you got more things to look at, more choices to look at. Not every free trader or fighter pilot at the end of the day is going to look exactly the same. Oh yeah. And now, when it comes now, um, one of the more recent entries that you've added, even though it's in a um in a separate gig, is um space combat. And I'm curious about two. I'm curious about two things with that. First off, um, do you do do you? I realize it's in development, but do you have plans to address to address both small scale and large scale space combat? Yeah, absolutely. Um. That one of the big things is when I did Mongoose Second Edition High Guard, um, large scale combat was one of those things that they said, "Okay, we need a system for that. Do it fast." <laughs> and it was like, "Oh, really? Oh, god." <laughs> um, but yes, absolutely, it is large scale combat is something that is definitely um, in the forefront of my thoughts, really, because mm -hmm. I've pretty much done and started. Uh, well, not even um, started, but been doing a few rounds of the large of multiple ship um small scale combat and as you know with most systems you know you probably don't want any more than like four ships when it's that super detailed um so yes i want large scale in there i i just need to make sure that to avoid the the problem that other games have done where we don't lose that i don't want to call it rock paper scissors but meaningful choices and uh let's say 
advantages and disadvantages you have with different kinds of ships and different kinds of size classes and so on in the small scale combat when I translate it to large. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's something that's going to, I find in large scale combat, you're going to have those imbalances stand out very quickly. Like if someone throws something at there and says, you know what? I think a thousand Corvettes beats everything else. <laughs> so that's just kind of like what I have to figure out what I abstract the that sort of group play into the hey guys, command a fleet, let's see how it goes. Which makes which um definitely makes sense. Um when it comes to now when it comes to the low scale of the low scale where you're just dealing with um small ships. Um, had you, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure the thought about dogfighting had come to mind because after all, uh, we grew up with Star Wars just like everybody else of our generation. Um, what's been your approach with that? So that kind of goes back to your, um, your, uh, hard sci-fi question. Mm -hmm. Um, part of the D drive, we'll call it the displacement drive that's, yes. uh, in universe is the fact that this displacement bubble that it creates, um, allows for the absolute translation values to be much higher given the, uh, sorry, for smaller craft versus larger craft. So while, you know, let's say a massive destroyer or something like that could quickly change direction because they were basically saying there's no immersion, no momentum. So it could quickly and instantly, you know, if it's going 300 meters a second or thousands of meters a second, one direction, it could instantly move four or five meters a second in the other direction with fighters it's just it's more so so they are more maneuverable um faster overall because the displacement drive has to basically the 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 hand wave but hard sci-fi reason is if i have to move something smaller i can move it quicker and i can uh um actually yeah that's it i could just move it quicker whether it's in the same direction or suddenly to switch direction now, how do you balance that so that you avoid either fighters are useless or fighters are everything? Um, this is kind of the arbitrary limitation based on the small craft, as I call them, agile craft of uh, weapon systems, specifically the range of the weapon systems. So this supports the um, that trope where you have, you know, the larger, whether it's um, Babylon 5, whether it's, uh, what's the more recent one? Uh, Battlestar Galacta, the Galactica, where the larger craft have more standoff weapons, whether it's those Lancer style weapons, whether it's ordnance, um, whatever the case is, while the smaller craft kind of have to run the gauntlet against other smaller craft and then finally try and make it in to combat at, at that in close at that closer range. And even when they do, um, similar to what's a good space, uh, sim that was at free space mm -hmm. uh, you're doing pin pricks right pins and needles but over time that will count so basically small craft are useful they have their i don't want to say niche they have their role they um they support that legendary ace style of play uh there are certain anti-small craft weapons, but the tracking basically speed of weapons that are used on a capital or a larger skip scale uh, cannot lay down enough fire to fire to cover all the possible displacement vectors of small craft. Because it may not seem cinematic, but the idea with the displacement drive is, okay, you're going to be almost like teleporting pretty much in... Uh, um, let's say within a sphere of your possible teleport range. So a smaller craft is constantly flickering in and out within that area. Um, if you can't put down enough fire in that area, you're not going to hit a smaller craft. So there's specific anti-small craft weapons. Um, so to get back to your point, it supports legendary ace kind of gameplay, um, especially on the smaller scale On the bigger scale, you know, you're not going to have flights of them, but you're going to have a couple of like legendary aces, but you can't not bring any fighters on one side, maybe, unless you have dedicated anti-fighter craft. Uh, I tried to make it in such a way that you do have to mix forces. Um, and yet, the main intent, you can definitely do a campaign where it's a whole bunch of fighter pilots in a military uh, setting. 
But I think what's also enjoyable, and I made it, I tried to make it uh, just as competitive, not, um, yeah, definitely equally competitive, is that a role based approach to this is the helm, these are the different weapons officers, this is the CENTCOM person, uh, this is the engineer slash shields person. Yeah, when it comes now, obviously, the, obviously the um, obviously, obviously um, Void Empires has has been has been around has um, been in development for a for a um, bit. Um, and I did I um, did I did see that you ha that you um, had even though it's not finished yet, you had a bit of material on do on doing a life path system, and I'm. I'm guessing a good. I'm guessing the inspiration for a good chunk of that life path system was um, the one that's in um, the life event system that's in that's in uh, Traveler. Um, yeah, so that you're right. That one's not finished yet. The life event rolls like um, the if you would like to roll for possible random events that add character flavor or so. Yeah. When it comes to the, when it comes to that, um, what? Obviously, obviously, there's going to be obviously. I'd imagine there's going to be some movements to try to try and distance it, so it's not, at, so it's not as um, obvious the connection. But were the but um were th were there any um, particular traps that you wanted to avoid when it came to life events? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question, uh, Mildred. Um, it's actually the it's funny. Um, a lot of the things I've come up with the game, um, since a lot of this was done, a lot of the main core was done uh, quite a, a couple of years ago before uh, I uh, had uh, my baby, and that's what <laughs> put a long delay in things. But I would pick up RPG books later, whether it was Fading Suns, Fractured Space, and I'd be like, wow, I've done almost the exact same thing. And I realized, at first I started to worry, and then I realized there's actually a lot of overlap and a lot of reuse between the systems, because... Um, we, it's not from the lack of ideas. It's just the commonality of what makes sense in mm -hmm. whether it's combat, gameplay, or creating characters. So the life path system. It's interesting that you saw um, Traveler in it. A lot of people have seen uh, BattleTech in it because of it's reminiscent of the, which I'm sure BattleTech obviously you know had some from Traveler. But the way I had it set up is that kind of large table that you can roll at rather than um, specific tables per career. It's very reminiscent of Battletech. And one of the traps, and, and a couple of other systems as well, but one of the traps I want to avoid is having RNG um, basically dictate your character for you. I enjoy playing, I think, as we mentioned earlier, probably before the interview when we were just chatting, I enjoy playing the, let's call it the random total fuck up character. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where, especially when things like Mutant Gear Zero. Sometimes, though, and this is at least true of my gaming circle, when we're playing campaigns that we feel are going to go for a while or we're starting them, we generally don't want RNG to dictate what comes out of our character. Flavor, sure. Very small um, aspects that could have some mechanical impact on a very minor level, sure. But one of the things I want to avoid is like a life path event that gives you a bonus attribute or significant skill boost or something. So that's that's the key thing I'm trying to avoid on the trap I'm trying to avoid with that. And yet make it meaningful enough just so it's not just flavor text without you know that you could have come up with on your own. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm tr so that's that's I think what I'm trying to avoid there. Mm -hmm. And with that with that with that kind of thing in mind. Like I said, I know I know that um, Void Empires is in um in develop in um heavy development at the at this stage but when would you see when did you um guess you'll have the next update for it out so um i did a i did a recent update which pretty much has the main uh, i want to say the the core rule book as it stands today mm -hmm. in um i would say it's 95% uh, completed. Uh, 
Now, the, you'll notice there's a separate link for Starship Combat, which or Space Combat, which isn't in there, as well as um, the vehicle creation and vehicle combat is in a very rough draft. So I didn't even put it up. So my intent is right now it's available and it's 95% completed. It's absolutely playable for personal scale adventures. Um, the space combat is, I would say the space section is around 70% completed uh, for spacecraft combat. My intent is as that section completes, I will actually incorporate it into the core rules. And then the same with vehicle combat at the end. As for a date, I'm thinking, um, now I'm going to say completed, but then I'll, I'll put an asterisk I completed and I'll tell you what I mean by completed. Uh, completed for the core rules for personal combat with any of like those, that life path part, as well as any minor updates, that's by the end of this calendar year. Um, spacecraft and vehicles probably within six months after that. The biggest thing behind um, this sort of me saying completed is, as you can see, there's a lot of placeholder areas in there that don't have art. Um, as I'm doing this uh, completely out of pocket, <laughs> art becomes basically the biggest stumbling block. And I've already spent a significant amount out of, out of pocket on that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, anyone listening to this or anyone hearing this, anyone would, uh, would want to discuss possible contributions are more than happy. But that's really art uh, and uh, any sort of interested uh, fiction are pretty much what I'm missing uh, because those are not my strength. Definitely not art and definitely not fiction. My strength really comes from that, the the system kind of approach. And that's what I kind of set out to do. Which def definitely makes sense. And I'll, and regardless, I'll be looking forward to seeing how Void Empires develops because obviously no matter how it develops, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean more pages. Um, <laughs> Yeah, at, absolutely. At the very least, I'll give. At the very least, I'll give you credit for hyperlinking your table of contents. <laughs> that was that was right there at the beginning. I'm like, I don't, you know, I think we've all had experience, especially back in the day, Mildred, or maybe it still happens now a lot. But with getting a PDF that's, you know, more than ten pages, and you're just ask, you're looking and you're saying, you want me to do what? I can't even click. Come on. <laughs> um, one of my my biggest hang up with get with um with rpg books of all of all kinds is navigation um yep i i have that's the reason why almost every time i get on a, a given book if it does or doesn't have an index um or if or worst case scenario if you pull the palladium problem where you have a table of contents that's filled with lies <laughs> because CM Beta wants to wanted to edit something at the last second. <laughs> don't even, hey man, don't don't knock Palladium. Actually, you can knock it as much as you want. Uh, you just reminded me of a mistake I made. My first <laughs> RPG ever was actually beyond the supernatural, like actual <laughs> RPG played in the group. <laughs> um, and like I'll I'll cut if somebody's got like a one hundred page a one hundred page or less book, I'll cut them a little bit of slack on indexes. Um, but if you if your if your book is two hundred or three hundred pages or even bigger than that, get an index. It's going to save you. It's going to save you headaches. And um, I know some people do the whole well, we bookmark the PDF. Um, what if I'm reading a printed version? <laughs> That's your the bookmarks in the PDF aren't going to do me any good. <laughs> yep. No, no. I'm I'm lucky in that my wife is a graphic designer, so um. She has been incredibly helpful in uh, giving me tips on layout and uh, basically how to make things look so they're not an eyesore. <laughs> yeah, and that's something that I appreciate because, like I like I said, um, I I don't I haven't studied graphic design, but I've studied web usability in the past, and because and um, because of that. Navigate navigation and la and being able to discern information quickly is vital. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, you, I've seen it in players. I'm sure you've seen it too. They get aggravated, put it down, and then they don't want to. They're not, they're disin disincentivized from spending the time and effort to try to work on their characters. Um, in some cases, you have that. In other cases, they'll just intentionally avoid 
a certain ruler, a certain mechanic. <laughs> yep. Hi, third edition grappling. How are you doing? <laughs> why do you got to bring up those memories? <laughs> because pain is eternal. That's why. Yep. But I guess, like I said, I'll be I'll be looking forward to what to what comes next. Um, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. No, thank you for the opportunity, and um, thank you for um, all the good questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, for any of your uh, listeners, guys, feel free to reach out. If you want to play test, you have feedback, you have anything, I'm more than happy to hear uh, everything and anything. So thank you, Mildred. My pleasure. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for a future update of uh, Void Empires or just a shitpost, um, the, the door is always open. As I often say, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Will do, and, it, and it's a date. Be hopefully uh, eight months or so from now, because uh, I would like to come back with something more sizable and uh, something I'm uh, more proud of, probably. You know, as uh, in terms of accomplishing more, that is. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>